<laughs> I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> Yeah. You see, I'm not perfect. And I know it. I tend to know what I'm not perfect about. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> Matter of fact, I can't think that I'm anything perfect in except being imperfect. I'm perfect about being imperfect. I'm pretty good at that. But, you know, there are some areas that the reason why, you know, some people think I may be wise in some things that I share from the Lord, when the Holy Spirit inspires me, that is, it's because I focus in what I do know. And what I don't know, I don't know. So I don't bother sharing it. Sadly, or humorously, whichever way you want to look at this, because I think it's funny, one thing I seem to do know and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's only my experience. But I do know one thing about the topic of men's ministry. I don't want it. <laughs> I've personally been involved in men's ministry, even led one one time, you know, in Alaska. But I've been involved in men's ministry at different times. And quite frankly, I'd rather not deal with men. No offense to them. I mean, even though I'm a man, you know, sometimes I don't want to deal with me. But I'm getting ready to kind of go check out, you know, at this church that I'm, I'm like, you know, being grafted into, so to speak, you know, by the Lord. And just kind of like, whatever God wants to do is fine. You know, whatever the church is doing, I haven't a clue, you know, because they're kind of figuring it out too. And, you know, it's kind of like, okay, Lord, I don't know what you want me there for. You know, I'm not exactly the best person, you know, to be <laughs> visiting a bunch of men, you know, and listening to what they got to say. <laughs> Ugh, you know, now, I'm not a bad listener. That's not what I'm trying to say. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty good at listening to all the stuff that men talk about. I personally am not interested, but, you know, they do talk about it. You know, they'll talk about their job. They'll talk about their career. They'll talk about themselves. They'll talk about their football team. They'll talk about their sports event. They'll talk about their exercise program. Matter of fact, men will talk a lot about a lot of ego things. And I'm not really interested. You know, I mean, quite frankly, most men's ministries that I've ever seen is all better said ego ministry than it is really anything else. Oh, sure, there's a spin on it. You know, it kind of... You know, there's a veneer of Christianity on top that makes it all look good, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, we want to be men of God and, you know, have integrity, you know, and have these other things, you know, and it's kind of cute now that we've seen some new things come out by the Baptists, of all people, of course, you know, or some other, you know, like, really straight, kind of tight, you know, right and dogmatic group, you know, like fireproof and things like that, but for the most part, you know... <laughs> When I get involved with men's ministries, I see a lot of superficial bull, you know, baloney that is. You know, a lot of superficial stuff, you know, about a bunch of guys getting together in order to get away with doing what they want to do. I never really see that many men's ministries, that is, you know, producing fruit that I would say would be like, hey, you know what, that's pretty cool, I want to go there. Matter of fact, most of the time, when I look at ministries, I want to go to the women's ministries, you know, they, it's like they got stuff going on. Of course, they too have their own little thing, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm always fascinated by women's ministries, you know, it's like, women's ministries have these neat Bible studies, you know, they're also in-depth and stuff, and they're like, really cool, you know, they're cutting to the core, they're getting to the bottom line, they're really into it, then all of a sudden they throw in something like, let's have recipe now. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> now, I do know how to cook, and I obviously have my own recipes and, you know, I do them and sometimes I even record them or remember them, you know, and do them twice, <laughs> you know, but I'm a good cook, you know, I've been a short order cook at times and I've created different things, you know, I know what a sous chef is, you know, <laughs> so I do know a lot of things about cooking, you know, maybe even homemaking, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, in a Bible study, I'm only dumbfounded by the interest and, you know, it's good, you know, that women have, you know, 
sharing recipes, you know, Bible studies. Like, well, that's okay. And flowers, you know, and other things. And, you know, just things that, you know, some people would say is normal for women. I'm just kind of, oh, all right. You see, I was raised in a matriarchal kind of family unit that, you know, my, I didn't really have a dad, you know, so I'm not really all this patriarchal thing, you know. My father was my father in heaven, and I'm kind of like really interested in the Word of God. I'm really interested in the Bible. I'm really interested in Jesus and a lot of things that are scriptural. I'm really not all that gung-ho about, you know, the latest football scores or what team you were involved in or what basketball game you got going. You know, to me, it's like boring, you know. Yeah, you know, I've done sports, you know. I mean, I, I earned my letter, you know. Tennis. <laughs> Somebody will say, well, that's a wimpy sport. Yeah, right. You come out on the court and I'll show you a wimp. <laughs> but you see, that's what men do. They get ego. They think they have to be one-upmanship, not subservient. You know, I don't see too many men's ministries usually, you know, like pulling each other's shoes off and washing each other's feet. You know, I was taught that in church and I did that with men at different times personally never in a men's ministry never as a part of a corporate group you know men getting together in order to be a men's ministry matter of fact most of the time when i see men's ministry i don't think they know what they're doing you know much less god knows what they're doing but i don't know maybe they do some i've seen use books you know like i remember the measure of a man by gene getz i used it as a home bible study kind of thing and when i was leading a men's ministry group, you know, that was in its formation stages, I brought people over to my house. I said, hey, come to my house. We're eating. Because I already knew, you know, men don't do good when it comes to just sitting there and listening. You know, if you're going to get them there, you got to do some kind of like, you know, power, you know, muscle, you know, kind of hairy chest kind of thing, you know, and do all this other junk. Or you feed them. You see, the weight of a man's heart is through his stomach. Now, that's what most women know. Or in the old days, they used to be taught that. So I always said, hey, you know what? You offer a guy a free food, he's going to sit there and listen. And sure enough, the thing I'd do is I'd put out a spread that I knew they'd eat. Because I'd put out a lot of food, and it was a wide variety, and they'd scarf. <laughs> and it was free. So I, I knew how to get men there. I knew how to keep men there. And then I'd kind of like, you know, ask directly pointed questions almost embarrassingly to each man, you know, in front of other men, because then they kind of got to answer. <laughs> oh, okay, well, you know, well, what did you get out of that? Well, I, you know, I didn't do it. But really? Well, then what do you think of it now? <laughs> See, there's always a way to kind of turn the tables, you know, if the Holy Spirit's leading. So I kind of, I kind of understood that, you know, at the time, because I really didn't treat men at that time as being men of God. I treated them as men of jerks. And that's what my mother used to say, you know, all men are jerks, you know, and then when I kind of read the Bible, I went, well, you know, not all men are jerks, but all men are liars and the truth is not in them, or at least it says, in my haste, I said. Now, you know, you know, I kind of agree, kind of, you know, pretty much men are liars, you know, they'll, they'll lie as quick as they'll tell the truth, you know, especially if they're like, you know, walls up, defenses up, you know, protecting themselves. But I have run into peculiar men of God that were either inspired or led by the Lord to do things that inspired me, you know, that ministered to me. Like, while I may not have been involved in the men's ministry, you know, like, say, at Big Calvary or, you know, some other place that maybe it turned into something good, but at the time when I went, you know, it's like, I'm, I did get involved in, like, the men's prayer watch, which was like an action group, you know, because we were doing something, you know, that I thought was right on. And so I did. I got involved in the men's prayer watch, so I would go to, you know, Big C at times, you know, at certain times that were scheduled, and I'd pray over the ministries, you know, and all the people that sent in prayer requests, because we get these little, little cheat sheets, you know, that were just kind of like, you know, David, salvation, Mary, healing, George, whatever. And you just get together with, you know, your partner, you know, and or however many people were there, you know, men, you know, we would, you know, hold hands sometimes, sometimes not, you know, depending upon whatever felt led. And, you know, we pray whatever we felt led, you know, each person. You know, we'd either say, well, does each person want to pray? We have 300 of these. Do you ever, ever really want to pray and stay all night? Or do you want to, you know, I mean, that was the basics, you know, and whatever we decided, we did. And I was blessed. You know, I, I remember that as a powerful time, a great move of the Spirit of God. 
But you see, now I'm kind of old. <laughs> been around for a while. You know, I've seen some of the Calvaries. I've been to some other churches. I've been with some men that have been in denominations. I've been with some men that have been non-denomination. I've kind of seen what some men do and some men don't do. You know, I really haven't changed my opinion much. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why God's letting me go to this kind of like meeting to kind of see what they're going to do. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe, maybe it's going to inspire me. I don't know. You know, when God couldn't find a man, He picked Deborah. <laughs> because believe it or not, in Israel there was no man found, but Deborah, God used, and delivered Israel by way of Deborah leading the men. I was amazed recently by a pastor who had the guts to say, I think, you know, problems in America are caused by men. Well, if I could find a man, I'd agree. <laughs> Most men are just a bunch of boys running around with their toys, you know. Boys and toys and man caves, you know. I don't particularly think of them as men. You know, or like when, you know, People offer up these heroes, you know, who are, oh, Tiger Woods is such a great role model. Oops! Until he was found to be indiscreet about what the role model he is of. What can you say? When a man's ways don't please the Lord, guess what? He's going to reveal everything about him. So I, I don't get into hero worship, and a lot of men's ministries try to set up heroes, you know, like, Let's Tebow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know men. I know Tebow's got his own issues, whatever they may be. I don't know, because I'm a man. I got my own issues. And I'm not telling you what they are, because I'm a man, I'm not going to tell you. Heck, I spent most of my life telling people what my issues were. <laughs> you see, I know how to share. Hey, you know, this is me. Yeah, I've got this problem. You know, I've been dealing with it. You know, Lord and I, and you want to pray with me? Great, I'll pray with you. And you want to be accountable? Great, you will try it. See how it works. Because believe me, I'll be more accountable than you'll be accountable because I don't hear you saying anything, but I'm doing it all. That's usually the way it works in a men's ministry. One person carrying the others, you know. Now, it's interesting. The Bible doesn't really record it quite that way. The Bible doesn't have a men's ministry. The Bible just simply has men and women sinners and people that are working on it you know there's no real saints you know i mean they're not all wonderful matter of fact most of them i see messing up somewhere at some time at some place in the scripture no matter who they are i mean you know even jesus kind of lost his cookies you know when it came to the temple you know he kind of got a little little ticked off you know the zeal of my father's house has consumed me well you know that was to fulfill prophecy he didn't have to he just did <laughs> Because it's like, you are misusing this area. You know, and God knows we do that today. But my point is, what happened? You know, I mean, I believe, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, that since the curse came upon the flesh, men don't know how to be men. I mean, that's bottom line. You know, you can usually tell a 20-year-old because he thinks he knows it all and he's trying to do it all and he can't really accomplish it. You know, good for, you know, if you're a supervisor, you know how to use 20-year-olds. You know, you, you kind of stick them in charge and kind of give them some boundaries that they're going to cross over anyways. But, you know, you try to give them boundaries, you know, and, and you've got your secondary boundaries just in case they go past the first one because you already know better because they're going to go past the first ones. But, you know, you got to cover. So if you know how to work it, you know, in business, you kind of know how to deal with 20-year-olds, you know, young men that are really kind of, you know, go, go, go. But in Christianity... Excuse me? You know, I mean, if you're going to be truthful about what Christians are like, I've gone to pastors' conferences and watched pastors acting like idiots, you know, inside of giving each other messages to teach each other. I remember one pastor standing up, you know, and telling me, Jesus was no wimp. Man, he was a stonemason and he was muscle bound, you know, and he had deltoids and adenoids and all these oids, you know, and, you know, he would tell you what for and get in your face. You know, I'm like, really? Now, I can go with Jesus get in your face, 
but personally, I don't see Jesus on steroids. You know, it just wasn't my vision of God. You know, and this man came from an area, you know, where he needed to be assertive, act assertive, you know, and vent his viewpoints about being into let the body build because after all, you know, this flesh that we're carrying around, we don't want to crucify it. We want to glorify it. <laughs> Let's kiss it too and tattoo it to death. I, yeah. Sometimes I don't think it's the problem of the world we have to not be a part of, but sometimes I think that we have to not be a part of the Christian world. Oops, I said it. Dare I say, we need to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith, you know, because kind of like sometimes maybe some things aren't quite kosher, <laughs> especially even if they just put the name Christian on top of it. You know, I see a lot of things that I just really don't, I don't get a handle on it. I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. Maybe in stepping out in faith, which is what I do a lot, you know, I step out here, there, everywhere, you know, God blesses, I go there. You know, if God wants me there, I go there. If God tells me to go there, I go there. If God says, don't go there, I don't go there. <laughs> God says, get out, I'm out of there. <laughs> you know, I'm, as fast as I can carry my feet, or my feet can carry me, either way, you know, I'm getting out of there. But when it comes to men, you know, I, you know, I always kind of, because I've seen what men do to people and each other. I'm not thrilled, you know. I see men carrying guns, you know. I see, you know, I've worked in security, so I know what carrying a gun's about, you know. And I've seen men, you know, do things and say things, and you know, one of the first things I've always been fascinated by is after service, you know. I mean, even in getting involved, you know, I kind of stood back, you know, just recently out of service. I always stand back after service, anyways, you know, because I can hear everything around me and I pay attention, you know, and I'm a visual person, so I see things and I audio person so I hear things and God opens my eyes and ears you know so I can see and hear because that's what I am as a Christian so you know I kind of watch some people you know that kind of you know and, you know a little hugging and this that and the other thing and some people do that you know but then I listen to what they say you know it's kind of like what are you talking about well you know George was doing this and you know Mabel was doing that and I'm like oh, yeah, all right. do you want to talk about you know gossip see my wife you know, she loves to listen you know Lately, she's been wondering about that. You know, it's like me and her have been talking about that. How come everybody comes up to you and talks to you? You know, I, I've been fascinated because I think it's a gift. You know, now I'm able to listen. I've been that type of person in ministry that listen to all the uh, stuff that people will say to you. You know, and you just kind of go, let it go because you know if you don't leave it in God's hands, believe me, you'll make a mess of it in man's plans because man's plans are really messed up. But God's plans, they always seem to work out. But, you know, people really are attracted to my wife somehow without her ever looking like she's a listener or saying anything. She's got some kind of, I don't know what it is, but they all talk to her. <laughs> don't know. But I listen from afar. I watch from a distance. You know, I see things and I kind of observe them and I kind of go, hmm, interesting. You know, and I kind of listen like after services and people are talking about the service or they're talking about, you know, church or they're talking about a football game, a basketball game, you know, a job, you know, the idea that people say is fellowship. Well, maybe it is for them, you know, and I agree that quite frankly, fellowship, you know, when you were part of a fellowship, you know, like in the collegiate days, you know, of the 18th century, you know. A fellowship could be, you know, people of a like mind getting together to share like-minded ideas of things that they were interested in and common interest. You know, like Harley riders for God, you know, and bike riders for God, you know, and rich people for God, and this, that, and the other thing for God, you know, because it's for God, so it's okay. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm the weird one. Odd man out. But in men's ministries, I haven't really seen that essence of Jesus coming forth. That personal devotion that Jesus as a man would have had control over. 
being a man himself. You see, he did those things that were pleasing in his father's sight, and that would be my example to be following thereof what's pleasing in his sight. Are you really examining yourself to see if you're pleasing in his sight, or are you just pleasing other men by what you see them do, and you're pleasing in their sight? Because most men just imitate what they see. I mean, quite frankly, how many people you know, will say, well, I've got a man cave, as opposed to, I have a study. You see, the difference between a man cave is man cave is entertainment for himself. Selfish, little, you know the word. <laughs> That's what the man is. I don't care how you look at it. You can say, well, you know, I have to have my entertainment time, so, you know, my thumbs are very good and active. Okay, oh boy. We got it. I think. Or something's got you. And so, they don't really examine whether or not a man cave is a good idea or not. They just kind of do it because everybody's doing it, doing it, doing it, making a cave in. Well, doing it. And so, I kind of think, you know, man cave, doesn't that kind of give you an indication of what's wrong with the picture? Or man talk? Man talk. I've heard men talk. What about God talk? I kind of like the God talk. The man talk, not so good. You know, Bible talk, you know, kind of sounds interesting. But, you know, that could be, maybe it's a Jewish thing. I mean, you know, personally, you know, when I was around rabbi, you know, a rabbi, I found him interesting, you know, is that I used to be the rabbi's secretary. You know, I take a, well, personal assistant, so to speak, secretary. That's what, in Chabad or in, Orthodox Judaism, that's what a man that goes around with the rabbi is. He's like an administrative assistant. He's kind of like goes around and says, uh, you don't want to shake the rabbi's hand. You know, sorry, he's, you're a woman, he's a man, he doesn't shake hands. You know, you, you explain things for him. You know, you kind of, but it's still, you know, cares, but, you know, he's like just tradition, you know, explanation. And I was helping him to get digitized, so I was bringing him in computers and getting him to hire a secretary because, you know, rabbis have secretaries, but, you know, you have to treat teach and train and talk and explain and do all these things, you know, especially if they're from another culture, you know, or another country, you know, and you bring them in and you teach them. But anyways, long story short was that the rabbi always wanted to talk about, you know, pretty much the Word of God. It was interesting about this rabbi because they always want to talk about Christians, you know, and I was like, new boy, you know, and I was like, eh, man, you know, he's got a point, but, you know, it's like, eh, not really a good one. <laughs> Because he really saw things directed, you know, and directly of what maybe Christians are facing today even, you know, and sometimes Christians are more naive than they are Word of God directed. And that's kind of what I wonder about, you know, in stepping forward and being involved in this, or at least when I say involved, I don't know what God will do. I only know that, I said, well... It may be that the Lord wants me to go there, because the Lord said, you know, go. I went, on. okay, that doesn't mean he wants me involved. Let's be real. I choose the direction of a man's heart is his own, but it's the set the order of the Lord. So I ask God for direction, because trust in the Lord, I hardly know, I don't understand in all the ways he acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. I want him to direct my path. So he kind of directed me to check out, you know, this study. Because sometimes, you know, even if a stranger shows up, doesn't mean the stranger's going to always be there, you know, and I'm kind of like a stranger right now, but maybe a stranger in the midst might help inspire someone to do whatever it is that God wants them to do. I hope so. It could be true. I was looking up and I saw two turtle doves up there, and I'm kind of like, cool. Of course, they sacrifice turtle doves. Ooh, hope they don't do that to me. <laughs> mm, hope I don't say nothing. Hope they don't see this video. <laughs> Ooh, Shh, don't tell them I recorded this. But, you know, it's possible there's probably hundreds, thousands, maybe more, men's ministry things that maybe they're good, maybe they work, maybe they accomplish whatever it is they set their goals out to be. But I know just for me, I really just wanted to ask you for prayer, because, you know, I just want to leave it there, because I don't really look forward to this. I'm kind of look forward to it because it's the church. I don't look forward to it because it's the men's ministry. Kind of sad, huh? 
you'd think that you'd look forward to it because, you know, man of God. No. Oh, well. I just like, frankly, the Word of God, the people of God, Jesus of God, God and His people. I like fellowship. I like Bible study. I like getting together, you know, talking about Jesus. You know, some of the other things that people talk about, you know, kind of, you know, can talk a little bit about, you know. What do you do for a living? Well, you know, I don't. Really? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Well, I kind of haven't been working for a while. Oh. Silence. See, people don't communicate anymore. The quality of interpersonal relationship and communication is a forgotten art. The integrity of the honoring of each other and preferring one another above each other to the point of exception and exaltation of the person in the conversation and the way that the words are chosen and arranged in the sentence structure in order to inflect and genuflect to the person that you are humbly submitting yourself to them and giving them the honor and glory of recognizing that they too are called by God and anointed by His Spirit to be that person that you see in front of them, that Jesus is in the midst of them and Jesus is in them and you can love them and encourage them and exhort them in the way that they don't even know that you're doing to them. People don't remember how to do that. Matter of fact, I don't think it's been around since King Jameth. <laughs> Have you ever read a King James Bible? No, I mean, you know, not your King James Bible you got. The first page, you know, way back in the front where they have this, to the honorable, most exalted, venerable, blah, 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 blah. You know, 70 titles before they even get to the point where it says, King James, and then go on to blah, 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 blah. In Eastern culture, the articulation of the verbage or verbalization of the words that are said to a person were the most important part. What you said was very important. You could offend someone by your words. Lately people have been talking about that, about how you could, you know, like bully people with words, you know, post it or text it or put on Facebook or whatever it may be. And a lot of people, you know, think they've been bullied when really <laughs> they just need to get a grip on what's being read because sometimes what's said or read isn't really understood. But there was a vernacular and a colloquialism of a typology of a way of approaching words and being able to speak without committing offense. That isn't something that's American. It was, you know, they like to right now, people like to use this expression to justify everything. You know, our founding fathers, our founding fathers did this, our founding fathers did that, our founding... No, they didn't, but you know, it's nice to say that. <laughs> you know, because whatever usually comes after somebody saying the founding fathers is an exaggeration. You know, you just could take that to the bank and, you know, if you want to argue about it sometime or debate it or do the research on it, come see me. I'm not going to come see you because, believe me, I, you know, I've done all my homework a long time ago for that one. You know, I'm a history major from way back. You know, it's like, uh-uh, no, they didn't. You know, it was a contentious lot and a group that was very divisive. You know, the fact that they even managed to get everybody to sign was a shock. And believe me, what you see isn't what you think you're reading necessarily. But some people think, you know, the founding fathers were perfect. You know, and that somehow there was this, you know, great, you know group of godly men, you know, instead of God shed his grace on these men, you know, which is why we sing God shed his grace on thee. But, hey, you know, everybody's got their opinion, I guess, you know, until they research. But a lot of people like to use that expression of founding fathers, you know, as though they were the ones who were perfect in some way, rather than the ones who worked out the way to find a means to present what they had set out to do, which was the Declaration of Independence and gradually the Constitution, and gradually to form a society that they felt was not necessarily godly, because that's not what their first purpose was, but to be independent, that man may seek health, wealth, happiness, and the pursuit you know, thereof. You know, it's kind of like, okay, because it's not firstly about religion. I'm sorry to disappoint some people. But 
hey, you know, that's just America. But in our culture, unfortunately, we're not trained up to be polite. We're not recognizing our Americanization as a bastardization of English to the point that it's even kind of disgusting some of the things we agree on to say and to do to each other that really our founding fathers and America would not have been like in the 16th and 17th and almost as late as the 18th century. It's only as we've gotten into the declination time where industrialization has brought to us a kind of a hardening of hearts towards each other. You know, like men are laborers rather than men are men and you treat each one fair. So, sadly, you know, we don't have to depend on each other like you did in a agrarian society. But in an industrialization society, you don't need each other. You can get someone else to do the job. And that's sad because that's where we finally found probably men quit being men and they became just part of society. I don't know, maybe I could be wrong, but you know, I got my own opinion. And like my mother said, you know, maybe, maybe she was wrong because she was kind of like a bitter woman, even though she was, by the time she died, she was like a dynamic Christian woman. A little rough around the edges, but you know, for a truck stop waitress, she's a pretty good Christian woman. I'm not saying she was much of a mother, but, you know, she's the best father I had. <laughs> Boy. Just ask any man <laughs> that she met. Um, and the scripture being, all men are liars, truth not in, doesn't mean all men are liars. It simply meant, in my haste I said that, because it's true at some point in time all men technically are liars but they also have the capability of becoming more than what they are and I guess that's the point is that I can hope for the men's ministry I can hope that if you have one men's ministry that you are doing something godly with it I can hope that it's not just an entertainment section of you know the church for men you know, which is usually what I see most as. I can hope that it has some biblical foundation that is working towards the betterment of man's actions towards each other and men encouraging and exhorting one another to become godly, that they would disciple each other, that they would commit to each other as Paul and Barnabas were committed to each other, as Barnabas and Mark became close together and Paul and Timothy as there becomes that kind of growth process where even though you may become angry you can still sin not where you become togetherness is more important than the actions of being I'm right you're wrong no I'll be wrong so that you can be right so that you can grow thereof because I already know the facts I don't need to exalt my name above yours but rather to help you to be learn it and of that of which God is teaching you at the time that you're learning it because that really is what it's all about a man learning how to wash another man's feet that's what a men's ministry should be revealing Jesus in you and seeing Jesus in